Good afternoon. Welcome to everyone to panel Geopolitics of Memory and Memory of uh, Geopolitics. Uh, my name is uh, Vita Zelcha and I am chair of uh, this wonderful panel. Uh, I am professor at the Department of Communication Studies at the University of uh, Latvia and uh, my research is related to issues of media history, collective memory, politics of history, uh, commemoration and ritual communication. Uh, our excellent panel, Geopolitics of Memory and Memory of Geopolitics, is dedicated to the transformation of memorial space in post-communist countries. The Russian aggression against Ukraine has encouraged a re-evaluation re of the attitude towards Soviet and Russian imperialism symbols in public space, as well as the debate about the history of the 20th century and its controversial issues. The events of the last year clearly show that the Baltic states and Ukraine have many common painful issues, both in the field of the history as research and collective memory as the use of the past by society and individuals. The recent development initiated new research into the impact of uh, geopolitics on collective memory. Therefore, today we will have three very interesting reports on the changes in the memorial space in the Baltic states and beyond during the post-Soviet period, especially in the last year, when the audit of the Soviet memorial heritage began. Our first speech, speaker is His Excellency Paul Brammel, and the title of, of his uh, uh, report is A Star is Shorn, the Demolition of the Victory Monument in Riga. You see on screen our first speaker. His Excellency Paul uh, Brammel is a British career diplomat. Currently, the UK ambassador in Latvia. Uh, his uh, previous postings as ambassador were to Romania, Turkmenistan, and Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan. He also served as the UK's higher commissioner to Barbados and Eastern Caribbean. Paul Brammer is the author of the book Diplomatic Gifts a History in 50 Presents, as well as three travel guides. It's nice to see you, and the floor is yours. Peter, thank you. Thank you very much. Can, can you all hear me? Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Thank, thank you. What a, what a fascinating day this is proving. It's, it's been lovely to be able to, to listen in remotely. As I say, I, I would much prefer to be be there with you, but unfortunately I'm un unable to, to be today. Um, so I want to talk about the demolition last year of the Victory Monument in Riga. And just looking at the looking at the news over the past year, the sandbag monuments of Ukraine have become a defining image of Ukrainian resistance to the Russian invasion. Their protection, I think, underlines the importance of the monuments in representing a Ukrainian national memory and identity, but also underlines that it's these very elements that are under attack. The occupation of territories by Russian forces might be accompanied by a change of statutes, providing new ideological markers, or more typically just bringing back old ones. So the occupying authorities in Melitopol in November 2022 reinstalled a statue of Lenin that had been taken down by the municipal authorities in 2015. But if a battle over monuments has been part of a wider war in Ukraine, then so too have monuments been at the centre of debates elsewhere, arising directly from Russia's invasion. So in August 2022, Latvian television set up a live stream in front of a 79-metre stele in Riga Park. So watching that live stream perhaps wasn't the most exciting of experiences. The, the pillar stood there, as pillars tend to do, until suddenly it didn't. At 4.42 in the afternoon of 25 August, it came tumbling to the ground. The stele, actually five bundled columns of different lengths, each topped with a Soviet star, was the central composition 
of the monument to the liberators of Soviet Latvia and Riga from the German fascist invaders. It was erected in 1985 in the dying years of Soviet power. On one side of the central stele, a female sculpture represented motherland. On the other side, a band of three Soviet soldiers depicted the liberators. Following the restoration of independent Latvia, the monument became an, a, a central actor in the contested memory of the Second World War. For the Latvian speaking majority, the laying of flowers at the monument on 9 May rang hollow, recalling the start of the Soviet occupation that had provided Latvia with nothing to smile about. In 1995, Latvia's parliament, the Saima, voted to replace the 9 May commemoration with one on the previous day, 8 May, now billed as a day of the defeat of Nazism and Remembrance Day for the victims of the Second World War. The following year, in a bid to look forward to a promised Western future rather than back to an Eastern past, the Saima adopted a law giving a completely different meaning to 9 May. Henceforth, it would be celebrated as Europe Day. This kind of reimagining of the commemorative calendar failed to resonate with the Russian-speaking minority. The continued commemoration of Victory Day on 9 May became a marker of identity for this group. But the nature of that commemoration changed and scale grew, developing the feel of an open air festival. And its character was influenced by the evolution of Victory Day commemorations in Russia. The George Ribbon started to appear Marches of the Immortal Regiment were added to the commemorations from 2015, with marchers carrying the pictures of relatives killed in World War II. For many in Latvia, the monument was not just a reminder of the painful decades of Soviet occupation, but appeared to have been hijacked by a Kremlin-sponsored agenda of the imperial aggrandizement of Russia. There had long been calls for its demolition, on the night of 5 June 1997, Latvian ultra-nationalists claiming to be heirs of the interwar Perpen and Krust's movement attempted to blow it up. They failed, and two of the group's members lost their lives in the explosion. But there were major obstacles to the removal of the monument. First, destroying the massive concrete stele with a steel armature was no easy task, as Perkin and Krust had discovered to its cost. Second, Latvia had in 1994 signed up to an agreement with Russia on the matter of the social protection of military pensioners living in Latvia, Article 13 of which required it to ensure the preservation of memorial structures. Third, there were concerns about the reaction both of the Russian government and Russian-speaking Latvians to the destruction of the monument. The Latvian authorities would have been mindful of the reaction to the relocation of the Bronze Soldier Memorial in Tallinn in 2007, which resulted in two nights of rioting and cyber attacks on Estonian institutions. But the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022 changed for many Latvians the balance of arguments for and against the removal of the monument. But what triggered action were the events around the 9 May Victory Day celebrations in Riga? that people should again lay flowers at the monument in an action consonant with Russian commemorations at a time of emerging evidence of Russian atrocities in Ukraine was considered provocative by many Latvians. Those mainly Russian speakers to lay flowers were in turn incensed by what they perceived as the insensitivity of their removal by a municipal bulldozer on the following morning and promptly returned to lay more flowers, the climate more hostile. Latvia's interior minister lost her job over the perceived mismanagement of the affair. The scenes left no room for doubt that the unswerving support shown by Latvia for Ukraine since the start of the invasion and its hostility to the Russian aggressor were not sentiments universally held by all of its population. The Victory Monument was clearly identified as part of a dissenting narrative. Just two days later, on the 12th of May, the Saima voted to suspend Article 13 of the 1994 agreement, making an explicit link between their vote and Russia's behaviour in Ukraine. The Saima's actions were carried out at deliberate pace, both readings of the bill voted on in a single day. And deputies were clear about the purpose of the legislative change. Krista Balmane, a parliamentarian on the government benches, argued that the monument in Riga, a symbol of Soviet occupation, 
had now also become a symbol of Russian crimes in Ukraine. Riga City Council was waiting on the Simus move, with the obstacle of Article 13 of the 1994 agreement now removed. The Council held an emergency meeting on the next day, 13 May, voting to instruct the Riga Monuments Agency to perform all necessary work for the dismantling of the monument. The Simon now worked to put into effect the dismantling of monuments now made possible by the suspension of the dis bilateral agreement. On the 16th of June, it voted through a law on the prohibition of the, of the display of objects glorifying the Soviet and Nazi regimes and their dismantling on the territory of the Republic of Latvia. It was explicitly a law aiming to eliminate monuments promoted an un promoting an unwanted narrative about Latvian history, one which lauded the activity of occupying powers, to allow instead a narrative emphasizing the Latvian resistance to occupation. The new law provided that offending monuments must be demolished by 15 November. The monuments in Victory Park were specifically identified in the law as requiring removal. And the law set out two other categories of monuments to be dismantled by the same day. Most importantly, offending monuments categorised as such by government based on expert advice. Monuments linked to burial sites of soldiers killed in the war and memorials for the victims of Soviet or Nazi terror were explicitly excluded from the exercise. The experts set to work and at the end of June presented the government with a list of 69 objects to be removed. Finally, the new law also allowed local authorities themselves to identify and remove additional monuments in their territories. The task of dismantling the monuments fell to local authorities, though they were promised that the state would bear 50% of the cost remaining after private donations had been taken into account. The reaction to the dismantling of the Victory Monument and other artefacts of the Soviet occupation differed markedly between Russian and Latvian-speaking communities. A poll by market research company SKDS, published on 7 July, found that overall 49% of respondents supported the decision to dismantle the Victory Monument, while 25% did not. But among Russian speakers, only 9% supported demolition. Among Latvian speakers, that figure was 72%. The different viewpoints over the removal of Soviet monuments are mirrored in very different responses of local authorities across Latvia to the instruction to remove offending objects by 15 November. In Riga, the municipality confirmed that not only had they kept to the deadline, but they'd actually supplemented their list by additionally removing some hammer and sickle symbols from facades, as well as taking down a plaque commemorating Martin Chpoga, a Soviet spy in Nazi-occupied Riga, who died in a shootout with German officers in the Grisian Count's neighbourhood in 1942. However, in Rez Rezik Bay and Daugavpils in the eastern Latgale region, local mayors, while complying with the new law, made clear they were doing so under sufferance. So in Rezik Bay, Mayor Alexander Bartoszewicz published a video making clear his opposition to the demolition of the 1974 monument of a gun-toting soldier, popularly known as Alyosha, and lamenting that the government had rejected his suggested compromise proposal to shift Alyosha to the local cemetery. In Daugavpils, Mayor Andres Elksnich posted on social networks an invitation to residents of the city to bring candles and flowers to monuments facing destruction as a way of saying farewell to them. The authorities endeavoured to ensure that the demolition of the Victory Monument would not be an occasion for protest. The site was railed off and anyone standing nearby was quickly moved on by police. Appeals from the Latvian Russian Union to the UN Human Rights Committee to stop the demolition of the Victory Monument resulted in a request from the committee on 26 August to halt demolition, but by then the central stalemate had already fallen. The excision of Soviet-era monument memorials in Latvia has proceeded in phases. With the restoration of independence, memorials to Lenin came down across the country. But war memorials were by and large left alone. With their associations with mourning and family sacrifice, theirs was a more complex story. Latvia's experience mirrors that of the wider region, experiencing waves of iconoclasm 
the first at the start of the 1990s with a second wave developing since 2015. Russia's invasion of Ukraine provided the impetus for Latvia to address the demolition of Soviet war memorials. The imperative to do so had much to do with the way that such memorials had contested meanings, quite beyond that of the commemoration of death and sacrifice. For some, the meaning of the monument in Riga's Victory Park was about liberation. The monument stood for Soviet and Russian achievement, a symbol for a Russian-speaking community in Latvia that mourned the loss of position and prestige. For others, the monument was about occupation, a symbol of Latvian oppression by foreign rulers. With Russia seeking to subjugate Ukraine, that imagery became too much to bear. The destruction of the Victory Monument and other Soviet-era monuments is but part of a wider picture, embracing the renaming of streets and parks and the acceleration away from Russian language teaching in schools. When the Victory Monument came down, Latvian Foreign Minister Edgar Zrinkevich tweeted, closing another painful page of history and looking for a better future. For many people in Latvia, Russian atrocities in Ukraine had provided the spur to turn a domestic page. Thank you. Thank you very much for your emo emotional speech. We have five minutes for questions. To Paul Braumel. I'm looking to the or participants of the conference. Yes, we have a question. Um, thanks very much, Ambassador, for your intervention. Iman Sliages, former uh, Latvian Ambassador. I, it's more a, a couple of comments I wanted to make. Uh, uh, I think uh, one of the matters that you could have added was the fact that the monument became, a, a, as far as I recall, a central focus uh, only during the time that we had a, an ethnic uh, Russian who was mayor of Riga. So it's during uh, Ushakov's period as uh, as mayor, that uh, it, you know, he encouraged the uh, uh, demonstrations on the 9th of May. Um, <coughs> and the second point is this terminology of uh, Russian speaking and Latvian speaking. I think uh, these are sort of really Soviet terms in many ways, and I think we need to be a bit cautious, especially in an academic uh, environment, about using these terms because I think we should actually say either ethnic, uh, Russians, ethnic, Ukrainians, ethnic, uh, Belarusians, because there's probably a lot of uh, Latvians of Latvian ethnic origin who speak uh, Russian in Latvia. I'm not one of them. Uh, and there are also a lot of Russians today who actually speak Latvian. So I think it's important to perhaps uh, try to move on from this sort of uh, uh, terminology of uh, Russian speaking uh, population or Latvian speaking population and be a bit more uh, precise on uh, how we describe uh, the various ethnicities uh, in Latvia. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, would you like to answer to the comments? Yes, no, I think, um, Imad, thank, thank you very much. I think they're two, two really good points. I think you're, on your first point, I think absolutely, I think the relationship between the, the colour of the local authority and, and sort of how commemorations un unroll at the, at the monument itself is, is very relevant. And I think we're seeing that, that's, we're seeing that in, in what, in the kind of response to the call for the demolition of monuments last year in, um, in Latgale, for example, as, as, I, as I say, I think the fact that the, um, the local authorities in Delgoth Pils and Resigne were clearly unhappy with the um, with with the call, even though they they complied with the rules in the end, I think very much coloured how, how that how that response to, took place. So I think your your point about local authority is absolutely right. Yeah, on, on the on the sort of R Russian speaking and, and Latvian speaking, I'm really conscious of that. I mean, it is very much shorthand, and it's it's really difficult to get quite the right term, um, and not least because. 
those who speak Russian at, at home as the sort of family language are, you know, come from a, a huge range of, of different backgrounds in Latvia, uh, not all um, ethnic Russians by, by any means. Um, so it, it, it is a little bit awkward, but I think it, it was just used as shorthand, and it's the kind of shorthand that's also used by sort of public companies like SKDS, because I think it does it does highlight that there are differences between communities of those who speak Latvian as a first language and those who speak Russian as a first language. But I do absolutely agree with your caution about the fact that you know the, the, there's a lot of complexity bundled in there as well. Okay, thanks. Uh, questions? No. I, I, uh, you have. No. Yeah. Thank you. I have it on good authority that it was actually the Lithuanians who actually demolished this monument in Riga. There's some sort of squad of Lithuanians coming from Lithuania, hired by you know the Latvians and so. On. So my question is: Is this true? And if, if it is true, then wh why is that? Is that because the, they couldn't find Latvians who would want to do that, or is it because just Lithuanians are cheaper and or more effective? <laughs> I think I think you'll have to ask Riga Council that one. I, so I, they, they, I don't know if they published it now the, the detail of the company involved, but initially that they they um, didn't sort of publish the the company that won the tender. And indeed, one of the quite curious things about the legislation um, that was passed by the Saima is it, it explicitly allowed local authorities to circumvent usual procurement procedures and that, I think that was done deliberately in order to make sure everything could be wrapped up by the, by the 15th of November so I didn't actually see who the winning company was so um, but but may, maybe it has been announced by now but, but well obviously they did a, they did an effective job the thing came down okay thanks uh, more questions no uh, I have a question. Uh, what is your opinion about the long-term impact of the demolition of the Soviet monuments on identity? For example, on identity of Latvia as a state, uh, identity to Riga as capital, identity to the different social groups, for example, Latvians and uh, Russian-speaking people? Yeah, I think this is a really key question, Vita. I mean, I think it it points to a kind of simplification of um, the memorial landscape in the sense that it takes out monuments which present a dissenting identity. And so, you know, the, the focus now is on, you know, the, the monuments that represent Latvia's view of itself, and obviously the Freedom Monument standing in the centre of Riga, um, you know, 1930s work full of pieces of statuary which represent, you know, the Latvian national identity from the, the figure of, of Latch Places to the, to the Cockley player are all, are all kind of there. Um, I think one of the challenges that is felt by the, you know, community of those, you know, some or some members of the community of those who speak Russian as a first language is, is about how they are represented in, in Latvia. Um, you know, whether, whether the, the diversity of the country really is, really is present or, or whether this, this kind of simplification means, means their marginalization. And I think there's a whole range of areas where there are concerns among members of that community that they feel that um, you know, the government perhaps regards them with suspicion, um, doesn't regard them as necessarily loyal Latvians, and, and you know, I, I think there is a, a, a feeling certainly among some members of that community, certainly some who I've spoken to, that they really feel that they, they need reassurance at the moment on that score. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, many thanks to His Excellency Paul Brownwell for the, uh, participating in the conference and uh, his report. And we are continuing. Our uh, next speaker. Uh, 
Our uh, next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Dmitry Suslo, and his uh, uh, paper has titled Mission Impossible or Possible New National Monuments in Lithuania and Beyond. Dr. Dmitry Suslo received his PhD in Memory Studies from University College London, where he now lectures at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies. He is also creative director of Climate Art and Public Art Commissioning Platform and has contributed to exhibition research at the Victoria and Albert Museum and other cultural institutions. His current research focuses on human ecology, critical issues in public art, and broader connections between culture and environmental change. Floor is yours. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, and uh, uh, thanks, uh, Paul, for the wonderful uh, paper on uh, toppling down monuments. Uh, uh, Something happened with the first slide is slightly too abstract, so I'll move on to the next one, uh, uh, which sort of would present the crux, I, I suppose, of my uh, presentation. Uh, but I'd like to start with this proposition that um, obviously the nature and the focus of this conference is on the Baltic region and Ukraine, and rightly so. But I'd like to suggest uh, that uh, a problem of monuments and uh, their legacy is not unique to this part of the world. In fact, uh, the processes that Paul described in his paper of toppling uh, monuments uh, and contesting uh, problematic heritage uh, is ongoing everywhere else in the world. At the moment, uh, we can think about the UK, where the removal of some of the statues of a former slave uh, owners is ongoing, etc. So it's, uh, it's quite a universal, uh, quite a universal uh, process, I would suggest. And uh, also, I think to begin, I'd like to uh, think about what a monument is and what does it uh, represent. Um, uh, really, from the 19th century, Statue of Mania, described by Hopsom in his classical work, The Invention of Tradition, where, uh, but whereby in Germany and, uh, and France, but elsewhere in Europe, um, mass monuments construction started in the 19th century. And arguably, it continues to this day uh, in other parts of the world. A uh, monument became this... Um, mnemonic tool to represent a very particular vision of a national history, a particular narrative with a lot of, um, with a lot of uh, silenced voices, with a lot of lacuna. And uh, that's one of the contradictory um, aspects of uh, monuments uh, uh, as such. And also their uh, possibility and their opportunity to instill uh, cultural and historic consciousness was questioned throughout the 20th century. Uh, so um, I'll just give you a couple of examples from, uh, from that period. Uh, so uh, in the early 20th century, the Austrian uh, modernist writer Robert Musel, for instance, uh, proclaimed monuments the most invisible thing in the world. And to quote, he, su he suggested that we simply overlook traditional monumental sculpture in public space and throw the famous deceased with a stone monument around their necks into a sea of forgetting. Uh, similarly, around the same time, in the 1930s, a very uh, distinguished American uh, public planner, uh, urbanist uh, Lewis Manford, uh, pro proclaimed the, the death of the monument, saying that a uh, monument was incompatible with uh, modern civilization and the ideas of urban development. Uh, obviously, uh, those questions uh, were raised uh, in the interwar periods, but if we think about the Baltic um, and uh, Ukraine, uh, obviously in the Baltic at that time was the first uh, time a period of independence, uh, first independent republics and the monument uh, to uh, uh, Liberty Monument in Riga and similar one in Kaunas were raised around the same time. So obviously it was a very important um, uh, gesture, a very important uh, mem memorial gesture to commemorate that uh, piece of history of that moment in time. And obviously, I think if questioned around the 1920s and 30s, uh, Latvians and Lithuanians wouldn't see those symbols as superfluous. And if we think about Ukraine and obviously the 1991 memorial and the uh, Maidan Nizalyozhnosti, uh, the pillar that uh, commemorated the, um, the uh, freedom and independence of Ukraine, obviously uh, that monument remains uh, highly, highly uh, powerful and symbolic. 
Um, finally, just a, a brief overview that, you know, in, particularly in the 1980s and particularly in Germany, the kind of the suspicious link between monuments and fascism was voiced throughout the German society. Uh, and, and this uh, sort of very, um, in Benjamin's words, uh, acidization of politics was questioned as a legitimate uh, thing. So um, the, the counter memorial uh, idea emerged as uh, termed by uh, James Young. Uh, so counter monuments were monuments against themselves. They were designed uh, by uh, several uh, leading German artists, including Jochen Herz uh, and others, that questioned this idea of uh, monument as a tool of commemorating the past that is not necessarily palatable and easy to digest. Uh, so, for instance, uh, uh, addressing their own uh, responsibility for the murdered Jews, Germans decided that it was not the right approach to, uh, to uh, erect yet another powerful, uh, powerful and power-radiating uh, vertical symbol. So the monuments became uh, more democratic, more linear, more, uh, I'd say, more horizontal rather than linear, sorry. Um, and that was the attempt to you know, to kind of bridge that gap, bridge that contradiction. And uh, really, uh, the two questions I would like to address uh, today is, um, despite all of this ongoing debate throughout the 20th century, uh, monuments remain a popular and a potent uh, mnemonic tool. Uh, and my question is really, what appears to be the monument's enduring appeal uh, in the 21st century? And I suppose we could uh, answer that question differently coming from different um, uh, parts in the world. You know, I suppose that question would be answered differently uh, in uh, Latvia uh, and uh, then in Germany or other parts uh, of Europe or um, other parts of the world for that matter. And um, also, um, Despite their ubiquity and um, you know, uh, the fact that they are uh, to be found everywhere, should all mnemonic objects, including monuments, commissioned by a state and perpetuating a certain narrative, be automatically considered a national monument? Or what makes a national monument? And I will uh, not, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure it's a cliffhanger for, for a lot of you. Uh, I'm not so sure, uh, but anyway, I will hope. Um, and I think, in my, in my opinion, uh, that a uh, German uh, researcher, Rudi Koscher, proposed a very interesting view of the monuments as uh, national monuments, not as a concrete thing, but as a process, an attempt of, fi of finding a unifying national symbol that could endure the test of time. So here I have the example of the Lukashka Square in uh, Vilnius. A lot of you are familiar with, uh, the, uh, with that memorial space. It's the largest square in Lithuania and uh, the preeminent national space in Lithuania as well. Uh, obviously, prior the regaining of independence in, 19, um, uh, in 1990s, the square had a focal point, uh, Nikolai Tomsky Lenin statue, which was there, uh, clearly dictating the way uh, for the proletariat forward. Um, but obviously, uh, with, um, I suppose, the removal of the Lenin statue, and there are a lot of parallels there um, that have been voiced today about Lenin apart in Ukraine and other similar uh, processes in the 1990s across the region. Um, uh, the removal of the Lenin monument on the central Vilnius Square happened on the 23rd of August 1991, so a very big anniversary of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact signing, and I think that was a powerful symbolic gesture that uh, give, gave tangibility to, uh, to the pact's reversal. So the pact was reversed, and Lithuania formally became independent. So it was obviously a very, uh, a very uh, powerful moment. However, the square uh, was at the monument. You've been looking at this slide for quite a while now. Uh, the, the square remained monument-free for quite a while, uh, presenting an urban and historical and, and artistic dilemma uh, to the Lithuanian society. And the urge to fill the void uh, that, was, um, uh, that appeared after Lenin's departure was as big as it was hard to actually realise, uh, because um, uh, finding a unifying national monument in the 21st century uh, proved quite, uh, quite different. Um, in fact, James Young, whom I alluded to earlier today, uh, uh, research of memory and um, counter memorials and memorials uh, and, and, and the Jewish history, of course, uh, suggested that uh, this idea of finding one power radiating symbol in the 21st century when not one, but pluralistic history exists and multiple voices, at, at times conflicting voices and conflict, uh, conflicting memories, uh, is really, really tricky indeed. So fast forward, uh, there were multiple competitions. How am I doing for time? Am I still on time?
Okay, great, perfect, thank you. Great, thanks very much. Um, so, um, the first attempt to, um, uh, to uh, erect a new monument uh, in uh, Lukashka Square started already in the 1990s. However, uh, it came to no avail, <coughs> excuse me, um, only in 2006, the Vilnius city municipality set the terms for the first competition for the new monument to be installed. Uh, and also for reconstruction of the square, which included, amongst others, the creation of that monument. Uh, however, none of the responses um, uh, and workshops that followed uh, that uh, competition uh, were realised and came to, came to any fruition. In 2010, the Lithuanian government decided to separate, uh, separate the architectural part, the reconstruction of the square and the commemorative part, uh, the monument um, uh, itself, uh, which resulted in this final image here. So in 2018, in fact, Lukashka Square was transformed, so it lost its uh, very... Uh, traditional uh, shape and um, in fact the architectural firm that uh, uh, um, uh, completed the reconstruction uh, went for this um, symbol of the tree of life which is uh, very key in the Lithuanian folklore um, uh, and as you can see here I don't know if you can see well from the slide but there's still a circular element there which suggested the need uh, or a space for a future monument that will uh, take place um, uh, uh, there or will, will happen there. Right, so that separation of architectural and uh, artistic part presented a challenge in itself uh, because um, um, in many ways um, the ideas about future monuments were quite dis uh, different. Uh, so uh, in 2016, um, a very important moment, uh, a newly formed patriotic uh, Vitis support foundation, Vitis after the name of the Lithuanian co coat of arms of course, uh, started lobbying for the installation of the statue of the Lithuanian coat of arms in the Square. And this is the plywood cutout, uh, which was at the time in 2017 installed in the square just to suggest how the future monument would look. So obviously it's a very traditional equestrian statue, which uh, some of the uh, Lithuanian public didn't quite agree with as a right monument to embody Lithuanian uh, struggle for independence and freedom. Uh, Fast forward at, uh, well, just one year, 2017, uh, the Ministry of Culture stepped in and the formal competition took place. And finally, uh, the, uh, the winner of the, uh, of the competition became a young uh, artist and sculptor, Andrius Lebaschauskas, whose project uh, you, can hear here, you can see here, sorry, it's the visualization of the future monument, which he called the Freedom Hill. Uh, as you can see, the design is very similar to what I suggested was a counter monument design. It's horizontal. Um, it was meant to blend in with the architectural landscape of a square, not suggesting a particular vertical uh, element in it. Uh, the minimalist design was also trying to reference some of the key tropes in Lithuanian uh, history and folklore. For instance, um, as you can see here, uh, part of a section of the monument was installed. Uh, in uh, 2019 in the square and that texture of tree bark was referencing the forest also the uh, the uh, the nom de gare of a lot of um, Lithuanian freedom fighters a lot of partisans uh, in Lithuania had uh, names derived from uh, the names of Lithuanian trees linden oak birch and others uh, so that was really referencing this in a particular way but Andrius Labashauskas deliberately decided not to go with a monument that would be very obvious or concrete his idea was that that freedom is not, can't be encapsulated with one statue, it has to be open to interpretation. So therefore, uh, if you look at the previous slide, people were encouraged to have picnics, walk around or discuss something, um, uh, well, just to use the square in a very civil way, uh, that way commemorating the freedom to be there and to be a free Lithuanian people. That, of course, didn't, um, uh, didn't uh, please many uh, people in the Lithuanian society and to this day uh, Lukashka Square remains monument free thus, thus suggesting a problematic connection between monuments and, uh, and, uh, and history. And uh, just very quickly uh, um, as a sort of counter uh, suggestion to monuments I would like to uh, talk about the concept um, proposed by uh, Michtil Widrich, uh, who wrote uh, her book on performative monuments, suggesting that uh, monuments could be viewed in a particularly different way. And obviously the Baltic Way uh, is a very key and important um, uh, moment in all three Baltic nations' histories, uh, arguably the history of the world as well. And in my view, it could also be seen as the 
uh, external symbol of Baltic uh, cultural memory uh, uh, and also a performative monument to freedom. And in fact, I suggest and argue that none of the monuments uh, or proposed monuments in Lithuania, for instance, I, I do not research Latvian context at all, so wouldn't attempt at commenting, uh, but none of the uh, monuments that were trying to uh, sort of encapsulate that idea and concept were as powerfully symbolic, I suppose, as the uh, monument, uh, as uh, the Baltic uh, Way. Uh, so how could it be viewed as a performative monument? So Michtil's uh, Vidrich's concept of uh, the performative monument uh, stems from this um, idea that um, uh, monuments uh, obviously all uh, you know, argue to be permanent or have a permanent meaning, which of course is not true. Uh, however, performance art, which is now collected uh, by museums and displayed, etc., uh, has an, an uh, element of uh, monumentality in it uh, uh, through uh, archival materials that are associated with uh, different performative gestures. Uh, so, uh, for instance, with uh, the um, Baltic Way. Uh, the, in 2009, uh, it was entered uh, on the UNESCO Memory of the World Register, uh, which is Documentary Heritage of Glo Global Significance. And part of the submission was, of course, uh, the uh, uh, different documents, uh, including photographs, printouts, uh, newsreels, etc., which all created this digital archive of a temporary event, thus arguably giving it a... a, a a permanence a bit of sorts, but also an ability to engage with a number of publics who didn't necessarily witness it firsthand. Uh, obviously, a lot of the people who live in, um, in Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia know about the Baltic Way, but not all of them have witnessed it uh, or took part in it themselves. And uh, arguably that uh, monument and that gesture uh, 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 engendered similar actions across the globe, the Hong Kong Way, uh, many other uh, events, including in, in the neighbouring Belarus during the 2020 protests. Uh, so, in a way, this approach to uh, monuments, again, uh, going back to uh, Kosha's proposition, as a process, an attempt of finding a unifying symbol, might be quite a workable one. And um, just very quickly, a couple of other examples. Oh, one minute. Okay, very good. So I'll move on very quickly. Fast forward. Uh, this is an example from Belarus from 2020 when the pedestal of the Lenin Monument was used uh, to uh, voice dissent. And obviously, uh, the more, more recent and um, more tragic, of course, uh, the multiple flags that started appearing spontaneously uh, on the uh, key uh, Maidan and Nizalezhnesti Square commemorating the memory of the fallen soldiers. Again, uh, the spontaneous gesture of it and the fact that it wasn't commissioned by the state in a way gives that particular monumental gesture a very powerful and um, resonating force. Um, and just to conclude, I obviously do not have illusions that uh, more traditional monuments will continue to be uh, erected throughout the globe. However, I think the purpose of monument uh, uh, to, uh, to remain permanent and embody a very concrete idea of a nation, a very 19th century concept, should really change and we should see them or approach <coughs> traditional monuments with a degree of caution. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. The question and comments will be at the end of uh, our panel. And uh, now our third speaker, uh, Dr. Dmitris Andreevs. Sorry, just a minute. And the title of his presentation is From Recovery to Securitization of Memory, Soviet Era Monuments in Latvia. Uh, Dr. Dmitris Andreevs is a graduate teaching assistant in the Department of History at the University of Manchester. His uh, recently completed PhD was dedicated to contested Soviet era monuments and their afterlives. His research interests are mainly focused on the politics of memory, 20th century history of the Baltic states, and post-communist collective memory dynamics. Floor is yours. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this introduction. So just to, to begin, um, let me see if it works. Yeah, just to begin to set out the scope of my presentation today, 
it's worth uh, to mention that my treatment of this division between recovery and securitization is very much a heuristic here today. Uh, but broadly speaking, I'll focus on two uh, periods, so uh, 1980s, 1990s, so the uh, period of independence movement and uh, more recent processes that I associate with uh, securitization of memory uh, in response uh, to, the, uh, to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Likewise, um, it's worth stressing that uh, my recently completed research was dedicated to uh, the period of early 1990s, so my observation on the more contemporary uh, dynamics uh, remain very much a work in, in progress. Um, in the remaining time, um, what I aim to do is essentially highlight the role and connection between uh, contestation and removal of Soviet monuments and um, the formation and articulation of national mem memory and identity in 1990s and then try to highlight how we can, under how we can understand the, uh, the more contemporary removals through the prism of that national memory. Um, so to kind of you know, uh, give a bit of a background, uh, so when we th think about the independence movement in the late 1980s, 1990s, the period which is referred to uh, Third Awakening um, in Latvia, so the period is very much recognised as being driven by the recovery of memory, right? So we have uh, rehabilitation of Latvian history and interwar symbols uh, that are at the core of restoration of independence in this period. And as this quote uh, by the first chairman of the Popular Front of Latvia and later uh, the deputy uh, chairman of the Supreme Council um, of the Republic of Latvia, uh, Dainis Evans highlights, the restoration and rehabilitation of interwar monuments was very much uh, part of this broader process. And when, uh, when we speak about interwar monuments, we speak primarily about the monuments uh, built um, to commemorate uh, war of independence. Um, Worth noting that the um, majority of them were removed in the uh, late 1950s, uh, some of them 1940s, so very much in the late, late 1980s we do see this process of actual restoration uh, taking place alongside uh, rehabilitation of those interwar monuments. So with this uh, increasing emphasis on restoration of independence in the late 1980s, uh, rehabilitated interwar monuments and here I am thinking above all of the Freedom Monument in the centre of Riga, uh, the monument that um, many of you know or have seen uh, in, your, well, you know, in your time in Riga. So this monument, um, the way I see it, perform an important mobilisation and even geopolitical function in support of independence codes. So to once again rely on uh, the uh, memoir of uh, Dinis Evans, the Freedom Monument as a symbol of interwar independence on a few occasions, such as the visit of the European Parliament delegation in early 1989, became a symbolic uh, calling card uh, for the restoration of lost independence. And with this kind of you know, rehabilitation, we also see a monumental reorientation, right? So we have um, uh, essentially turning away from the monumental representations and symbolic foundations of the Soviet regime. Right? And here uh, we can think about uh, Lenin monuments in, part in, in particular. So when it comes down, um, well, just a sec. So when it comes down uh, to contestation of those Soviet monuments, right? Like this one, which uh, was a, a Lenin monument um, in the center of, uh, of Riga. It's worth stressing that this contestation uh, was very much a, a gradual process and very much driven by uh, newly emerged uh, social movements, social actors and later municipalities. The, this contestation uh, was underpinned by the subversion of uh, Soviet historical narrative through reassessment of Soviet commemorated past and by extension Soviet articulations of Latvian history and identity. This process aimed primarily at the symbolic deoccupation of Latvia, took many forms um, throughout this period. For instance, as can, uh, as can be seen on, on the left, uh, it took the form of a daring placement of symbolic coffin at the feet of the Lenin Monument on 21st January 1991 to highlight um, the, um, um, the, you know, the criminal and deterrent nature of the Bolshevik regime already throughout 1920s. Right. 
or, or a more radical burning of the red linen, according to some reports, uh, or in other words, the flag of the Soviet Union on 7th of November 1999 that you can see on the right here. So the way we can think about this challenge, um, you know, um, this challenge by actors such as Latvian Women's National League, Helsinki 86, or Popular Front of Latvia, to the historical narrative that the Lenin uh, monument was supposed to embody. Um, essentially, the purpose, uh, you know, what that did is contributed to the rejection of Soviet symbols as foreign to Latvian, uh, well, Latvian landscape and history. Needless to say, as we know, these processes of recommemoration and decommemoration of the past were not confined to Latvia alone. Even a cursory review of the literature uh, can yield references to similar processes taking place in Lithuania, Estonia, Ukraine, Moldova and beyond. Uh, for instance, on the left here, uh, you can see a Lenin monument in Vilnius. Uh, together, a uh, picture together with artists and contributors to Lithuanian satire magazine, Broom. Uh, pictured in 1990. So as the pose of artist underlines, uh, the country was likewise increasingly moving in the opposite direction to the one directed by Lenin. On the left, uh, we have a photograph of the removal of the Lenin monument in Tartu, and significantly uh, the poster reads, uh, socialism is equivalent to fascism. So um, to, the significance of that is that both monuments in Tartu and in Vilnius were removed on, uh, as we've heard, on 23rd of August in 1990 and 1991, respectively. That is, on the anniversary of the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which, as we know, divided Europe into the spheres of influence between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union in 1939. So the pact and the way it was remembered uh, at that time is an important reference point for understanding some of the foundations of the emerging national memories across the Baltic states um, throughout the early 1990s. So when we, th uh, when we think about um, you know, those national memories, they also will become an important lens through which the removal of the Soviet war monuments after Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine can be understood, understood through. Right. So when we think about, uh, you know, about this process of frustration of independence, so amidst that process, the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, Pact became a mnemonic filter through which the origins of the Second World War and, by extension, the occupation of Latvia were understood. This stance um, finds its reflection in the overarching structure of national memory in Latvia and the Baltic states more broadly. As, as can be seen on a slide, um, you know, we, can th uh, we can speak about three, uh, three cl clusters of commemorated past when it comes to the uh, 20th century. So this relates to the years uh, of independence when we think about the interwar period, its wartime loss um, and uh, you know, the focus uh, on Soviet occupations in particular. And the third cluster is dedicated to the processes of uh, regain, uh, or regaining independence. Um, moreover, looking at the embodied uh, narratives within that structure, the Soviet period is conceived as something uh, abnormal in the national history, as an interruption of no uh, normal uh, national development, or uh, some Estonian scholars um, uh, refer to it, uh, based on their research, as rapture. So we have this kind of rupture uh, within this uh, national statehood that was established um, in 1918. And as we know, uh, since the accession to the European Union, as many scholars uh, highlighted, uh, Latvian, Lithuanian, Estonian and Polish members were at the core of bringing this uh, memory of Soviet occupation and thesis of equal uh, criminality to the European level via transnationalisation of a commemoration of the anniversary of signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Uh, needless to say, uh, this position very much conflicts uh, with the Soviet era and contemporary Russian focus um, on the uh, liberation of Europe. So, uh, when we think about then, the removal of the Soviet war monument since February 22, I propose uh, it can be understood not only, uh, not only as an expression of geopolitical solidarity, but in equal measure as part of securitization of national memory and memory of the Second World War in particular. Uh, to draw on the work of uh, Maria Malksoy, the securitization of memory can be understood as uh, being driven by the attempts 
uh, to make historical remembrance safe from alternative articulations of the past uh, through various means, uh, whether it's delegitimization or trite criminalization of this alternative. The point worth stressing is that in large part securitization takes place in response to the geopolitical uh, projection of Russian narrative of the Second World, Second World War. In 2022, um, sadly, it was Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the narrative employed as a justification of its action that became a tipping point that pushed Soviet war monuments into the realm of syst uh, systemic removal to which they were largely immune uh, since 1991. Um, worth stressing that uh, Lithuania had a slightly different approach where uh, a few uh, war monuments were removed throughout 1990s but very much in Latvia, apart from a few tank monuments, they uh, remained intact uh, since 1991. And when we think about that, uh, you know, um, about the law, uh, about the law that has been mentioned already, you know, the annotation and uh, and explicit aims of the law uh, that provide the legal basis for the removal of those monuments and more broadly Soviet regime glorifying objects, you know, explicitly link the necessity of the adoption of the law to the war and to the, need to uh, and to the need to protect the historical narrative. The linking of the Soviet and Nazi German regimes in the law is not accidental either and can be understood precisely through the attempt at making this position on the equal criminality of the two regimes secure, the, the position that first came to the public fore in the late 1980s. In some ways, as uh, some scholars noted, uh, such as uh, Martin Schminteris, uh, in a recent article, it can also be understood as a strategic uh, decision, as a decision to not only, uh, you know, make sure that this, uh, you know, position as is, is known, but also as uh, as a decision to preempt criticism, because you know, when we think about the title and the scope of the law, you know, the question is how many Nazi regime glorifying objects are there in Latvia? And if there are none, you know, why include them in, in the law? So, um, you know, just a, a bit of a, uh, a bit of a caveat on that, on that um, um, law. Um, there are, of course, you know, some downsides uh, to, to the securitization, right? And those ones are very much, you know, things that uh, come from, through, uh, from literature and, and from um, you know, re re academic reflections on the, these processes that are happening in Latvia and as well happening in, in Estonia and Lithuania. So for instance, you know, some of the ones that I highlight here uh, came from uh, an interview uh, with an Estonian scholar, uh, Marek Tam, on, on the memory politics in, in Estonia. Uh, so, I guess one of the, the main uh, potential downsides of this is, is that, you know, when we approach history as a security threat, it can have a negative impact on a free discussion about the past. So it is not to say that, you know, all monuments uh, have to stay in place, but, you know, we have to make sure that there is still, you know, a democratic approach taken to that, you know, and when we think about some of the secrecy around the task force in Estonia, or, um, you know, a bit of a, um, and, you know, a still, um, not uh, a clear transparency about the criteria that has been used for classifying those uh, Soviet regime glorifying objects, um, um, you know, uh, in Latvia. That's kind of some of the things that we have to keep in mind, you know, especially for uh, for the future when we, when those uh, processes will be will be studied. Um, another way how we can think about those. Um, uh, those processes that are unfolding and then again, you know, those are very much, you know, the preliminary observations because, you know, the processes are still ongoing and, and you know, we'll still be, um, you know, uh, evaluating uh, them uh, for years uh, to come. But another way to think uh, about them is through this lens of decommunization, right? And we know that from the uh, experience of Poland and experience uh, of Ukraine. Um, and an interesting thing that um, scholars observed in, in a context of uh, Poland is, uh, is that this decommunization process also can lead to what they refer to uh, paranoid looking or more broadly, um, you know, when we think about suspicious examination of the public spaces for those offending objects. 
right? And uh, we can see this process also kind of taking place um, across the Baltic states as well. So this can be observed in the discussions within the Riga City Council on the removal of elements of facade. Recent legal discussion in Estonia on whether whole buildings can reasonably fall under the uh, offending category of inciting hatred, or more broadly, um, you know, it is possible to highlight street renaming initiatives across the three states. Again, this is not to say that those processes you know, don't have to happen or that we don't have to uh, you know, remove those objects. It's just that we have to be conscious of, of those processes and potential you know, negative um, impacts those processes can have. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, yeah. Um, so basically, uh, what the, the point, that, uh, the broader point I want to stress is that, you know, very much those processes are unfolding simultaneously and in many ways reinforcing, uh, reinforcing each other. And for, uh, you know, we'll have to take, uh, take uh, all of those, you know, interconnections into account um, when we'll, uh, you know, uh, when we'll be, uh, will we continue studying those, those processes um, in the future. So I, I think I'll just, you know, uh, conc conclude here, uh, just not to take uh, more time. Okay. Thank you very much for your uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, now we have 20 minutes for uh, questions, uh, comments and uh, discussions. Who would like to start? Thank you very much uh, for both of your presentations, very insightful. Uh, I'm Zander Wagner, I'm from Ministry of Culture. And uh, one thing which I would want to ask, uh, I didn't see it uh, completely in your presentations, but I'm certainly sure there is uh, uh, something within that this discourse uh, is of course that, uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, removal of, uh, of uh, difficult uh, and uh, controversial monuments is not something new in the history of mankind. And uh, in this context, uh, probably, and, and I didn't hear that specific uh, terminology, but something probably which is very important to uh, talk about is, of course, about societal evolution, that societies are not uh, uh, constant, uh, uh, let's say fixed at, at, at only at some moment. And also, uh, if you look at uh, Latvia as a nation state, uh, it's 100 years old. And if we look from the moment of the 100 years back, and the evolution of Latvian society in between having this uh, very tragic occupation of the uh, Soviet Union, then also you see, especially in these last 30 years, that evolution, due to come becoming and regaining its, uh, its, its, its place in democratic uh, societies and becoming again a democratic society, is really a truly remarkable evolution of this nation with all its people there. And therefore, how do you evaluate uh, also removal of these monuments in the sense that is also a value-based removal, a value-based removal which happened exactly at this exuberation of another uh, tragedy which revoked everything where the state actually, uh, the, let's say, which revoked the Latvia's uh, first beginnings on the, on, and, and, and the first, uh, let's say, pause in its democracy. So how do you evaluate from the societal evolution and also how do you evaluate on the scale how this uh, replacement of the monument uh, is actually a value-based removal? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, I, can, I, can, I can take that one, yeah. So yeah, when, when, you know, the way I understand that, you know, it's, I do agree with you, it's very much a value-based removal. And when we think about, um, that's something that I, you know, um, when I think about, you know, it's very much connected to the national memory and understanding of, you know, that, that history. And as, you know, has been, you know, pointed out, it very much, 
you know, uh, the uh, invasion of Ukraine became a tipping point, right? And we have this, you know, a new emphasis, right? The, the word of the year, occupaclis, right? You know, that tells you something about, you know, the, the process, right? This, this is the word, obviously, that, you know, links back to the earlier tradition of Leninicalis, right? Uh, but it's not the word that ever existed in circulation until pretty much 2022. Right, so it underlines that you know this, those monuments do get new meaning, uh, you know, w with the invasion of Ukraine, and it is linked back to to the national memory and obviously memories of the Soviet occupation. Yeah, thanks very much for your question. Um, I'd just like to add. Yeah, I agree with you entirely. It's a very important question. I mean. There are so many examples of iconoclasm we could find throughout history and removing a, an idol, which a monument effectively is, and replacing it with a new one is quite a natural urge, uh, natural uh, quotation marks, of course. Um, in 1995, um, a Russian scholar Mikhail Yampolsky wrote, wrote about it uh, w with regards to removal of Tsarist uh, era monuments by the Soviets. And then, I mean, obviously it implied the Soviet monuments in some parts uh, which were occupied by the Soviet Union would later be removed as well. I, I think it's a very continuous process and I don't think there's a clear answer, unfortunately. I think uh, the impetus to remove uh, an you know, a, a reminder of a very inconvenient past is quite uh, hard to suppress. And we can see it again in other contexts, not just in um, the countries that were occupied by the Soviet Union, but also in the countries that were in, in themselves, um, um, you know, historical, uh, you know, they were uh, perpetuating historical crimes like slave trade, etc. And you see this attempt of removing monuments that commemorated that difficult past. Um, I don't think it was a clear... Uh, answer as to what is the best approach to it. I think maybe engaging with the, with the past uh, in a way that doesn't involve its erasure might be a more uh, theoretically more uh, constructive one. However, I think it's very hard to realise um, um, actual fact. So, yeah, thanks very much. Yes. Uh, thank you. Maybe I, I see Ambassador also is here. Maybe you want to add something to the answers of uh, our colleagues? Yeah, I mean, I think just, just to offer, I, I very much agree with, with all that's been, been said. I think just one general observation is, is um, as Dimitri said, that there's absolutely nothing new about um, removing statues. I mean, you go to the ancient world and people are absolutely ruthless at, about either removing statues or completely repurposing them. Some, sometimes they would leave the statue in place and just kind of change the name on the plinth so that the statue commemorated a completely different emperor. Um, I, I think it's also worth noting that if you've got a problematic monument, there's quite a lot of different things you can, you can do. There are a lot of decisions you can make. So, so one thing is actually to leave the monument in place, but to put some kind of explanatory signage, um, you know, to offer cautions about the, the, the subject depicted, or you could move, move, the, move the object to a less central, central position, so uh, you know, the triumphal arch which commemorated in, in Riga, which kind of commemorated um, uh, the arrival or the visit of the, of the Russian Tsar, I think, was, was in the centre of, center of the city. It's now been shifted out to a, to a park on the edge of the centre. Um, or you can... Uh, or you can kind of change the... You can, you can kind of change the statue, leaving it, leaving it in place, but kind of subverting its meaning completely. So I think one of the Lenin statues in, in Odessa, in Ukraine, was converted into Darth Vader, so it's, it's still there. Now commemorates a completely different figure. So I think there is there is an awful lot that can be done, but, but I think iconoclasm has been a kind of central feature of human history almost since the, since the first monuments went up. Okay, thank you. More questions? Yeah. Or... Thank you very much. Okay. Adam Charlotte. Uh, <clears throat> Thanks very much for the papers, and uh, I got the comments and the paper. I mean, so when you talk about mo monuments, the monuments actually what the Pierre Noracle, the places of memory, they are not memory itself. 
That's what puzzled me in the presentation is the ontology of memory. It means, well, how do you understand the collective memory, basically? Since Halfla, beginning of the study of collective memory, memory, memory is not what happened in the past. Memory is dictated by the present. It means that all those political interests which exist in the present actually are telling us what we pick up from the past, right? And that leads me actually to the question, what sort of the social theory you accept behind your papers? Because on the one hand, it means in the first paper, you <coughs> Dimitri claimed that, well, with the change of the nation from the monolith to something else, right? Let's say society, there is a change movement from this traditional concept of the monument to the new one, performative monument as such. But what comes to my mind is, could you call, let's say, the military parade in the 19th century not a form of the performative uh, monument as well? Probably they are quite similar. They were not called like this, but played a similar role, it seems to me. To the second paper, what Dimitri is, it means in this diagram, you mentioned this normality. Sociologically, normality doesn't exist. That's a, not a sociological concept. So therefore, how do you understand? What is normality from the point of view of memory? Thank you. Okay, okay. it means that you should start. Yes, of course. Uh, thanks uh, very much for a very uh, insightful question. Uh, so when I was uh, trying maybe uh, inarticulately to talk about performative monuments, it was a proposition uh, to uh, view a certain uh, external symbol of national memory beyond a concrete marble embodiment as we are all accustomed to view monuments. Uh, so in a way, I was just trying to say, uh, absolutely agreeing with you and the ideas of uh, Lieu de Mouin, uh, proposed by Nora, uh, the sites of memory, the ma many and uh, monuments are obviously just one, one of those um, external symbols that nations choose to have. Um, uh, so uh, the one thing that monuments claim to do is to remain in perpetuity and have a stable meaning. And that's one phenomenal failure of all monuments is to retain that perpetual meaning because as was uh, voiced before, societies change, uh, values also evolve and certain archaic ideas embodied by those concrete uh, representations do not hold true. So uh, the idea of performative monument as looking at the idea of what makes a certain gesture permanent, or at least what extends the duration of, of its engagement with the audiences. So that's the, um, uh, that's the theory of performativity, uh, which was developed um, back in the 1960s, uh, and, uh, and could be, I, th I think, translated as well uh, in, into, uh, into the study of cultural memory. Uh, so arguably, um, all the archival materials which are associated with the Baltic Way, uh, these are photographs, reports, uh, oral history, uh, all collected um, together, and they were collected by the three Baltic republics to submit this um, uh, uh, the uh, nomination of a Baltic way on the list of UNESCO, uh, created that monumental space, uh, or gathered all those artifacts together that allowed, in a way, to extend the duration of that particular uh, that particular uh, event. So, yeah, I suppose. That might be a slippery idea of how we view different um, different uh, cultural or uh, sociological uh, or historical phenomena, uh, which involve a gathering of people uh, together. I, I don't think we can all uh, we can claim that all those um, events are monuments, but I think certain uh, elements that are uh, allowing us to extend their duration in our uh, cultural memory could land them a degree of permanence that monuments claim to have. I don't know if I've answered your, your question or, or not. Continuing. Yeah, uh, yeah I, mean, I, I, I can add, if, if, you know, obviously, I, as, you, as you know, I mean, there are so many different conceptions of, of memory. And, you know, um, I draw primarily on the Lady Ashman, one, you know, on their work, typological work, when I speak about national memory, you know, slash political memory. Uh, but on a question of normality, I mean, that's very much, you know, and here I draw on the scholarship available, right? There's a great book um, called Imagining the Nation on the Revolution in History in Latvia by Aglitis. 
you know, um, who kind of looks at those different uh, models and discussion about what is normality in that period, right? And that's very much connects back to the discussions, you know, are we restoring independence? Are we creating a new, you know, um, and so essentially that all links back to, to, that, to, to that, if that answers the question. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, more questions? Who would like to continue? I'll start off with a question. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there was a me memorial uh, constructed for uh, Stalin in Georgia recently in the last few years. Is that correct? Have you heard of it? Maybe. I also saw something yeah. like that. Um, now, assuming that that is the case, how would you interpret that? Also, new monuments of Stalin in Russia. That is also other topic. Georgia is the, the key question. The key. Who would like to comment? Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, no, I'm, I'm not that familiar with, uh, with the Georgian context. The only thing I do know is that there has been a lot of research done. So there were um, quite a few uh, articles published over the last five years that actually looked at the different attitudes towards Stalin and Stalin statues, but I'm, I won't be able to command concretely on, on that. Uh, well, thank you. It's uh, obviously, if it's a hypo hypothetical question, I'll g give a hypothetical answer. Um, I, I, I think that obviously it would really depend on the context in which this monument was constructed and f to which end. So for instance, we have in Lithuania, Grutus Park, where all the Sov Soviet memorabilia, all the monuments and statues are kept in a very uh, de decontextualized fashion. So uh, all the monuments are there for us to see, but they're not necessarily celebrating uh, the past. Uh, similar parks are to be found elsewhere. So that monument would be, in that context, maybe it would be just commenting on something. But if you're suggesting it's somewhere to uh, glorify the memory of Stalin, then I wouldn't uh, know how to, <laughs> to answer that. If I'm not mistaken, it, yeah. it was constructed at the place of birth right. Right. of Stalin. So that gives you more context right. to answer the question. Yes. Well, uh, again, uh Again, uh, uh, if it's a memorial plaque, for instance, that marks uh, the place of birth of a uh, obviously, uh, you know, a tyrant, a, you know, a very problematic historical figure. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, I, th I think obviously, uh, you know, it's still, you know, the role that that Stalin played in history is obviously enormous. So I suppose that if uh, they decided to mark his birthplace as a location that needs to be visited or remembered or uh, known, I don't know. Uh, it's really quite. Uh, it's really uh, yeah. I, I don't know. It's really quite tough to answer your question. Uh, do, do you have your own answer to that or interpretation of uh, what, what you would? <laughs> uh, um, I don't really, but I think it is to commemorate. The, the birth of a great man in that particular area. We may describe him, and he was a tyrant, mm. but to the people there, mm. probably he is still a hero, mm. unfortunately. Can, yeah. no. can, can I come in on, on that one? Um, can, you, can you hear me, sorry? Yes. Yeah, yeah just, just to say, I mean, I was, I was ambassador in Romania for, for four years, and in the home village of Ceausescu, there is, there is still a, a large, you know, nationally controversial bust of Ceausescu in, in the garden of his, of his sort of birthplace. And I think that is, you know, reflects the fact that, you know, while nationally he is, you know, a, a very considered very negative figure, you know, in, in his birthplace there is a certain local pride in, in the fact of, you know, an important person coming from this village. And I think in, uh, I, you know, my suspicion is in, in Georgia there are perhaps similar dynamics uh, taking place that if you're from, I think it's glory, wasn't it? Um, yeah. That if you're from the Georgian mountains, there must be, for some people there, there is, there is a pride in, you know, a big person coming from 
from that locality and wanting to be wanting to be commemorated. But I think there, if I remember rightly, I think the the, the big statue in his birthplace came down a few a few years ago. So I think the sort of anti-Stalin sentiment prevailed. But maybe there are there are other statues that have gone up, gone up since then. I don't, I don't know. There is similar controversy about the statue to Margaret Thatcher in Brampton in England. <laughs> yeah, that is a question about the local identities and uh, collective memory. Collective memory as shared history and the using of the history in public space, in culture. Uh, using history by different uh, large and small social groups. Yeah, next question. We have three minutes. Yeah. Is it working? Oh, I, I don't know if I can take the floor and so a few minutes remain. I'm Stefan Hexman from the Nordic Council of Ministers. Uh, I have served as Sweden's ambassador to Belarus, so I can't help but resist from asking a question to Dmitry, who also has connection to, to Belarus. Uh, it's about Minsk and urban space and monuments uh, in, in Minsk. I understand it's a theme for a separate lecture, but if you should, could shortly comment on, on the specifics and the dilemmas uh, um, of the um, yeah, monumental space in, in Minsk, uh, I'm thinking of the big squares uh, built during the Soviet times uh, that have caused problems for, for Lukashenko lately and uh, yeah, well, some short comments would be of interest, thanks. Thanks very much for your question. And I think um, the question of Minsk uh, certainly uh, deserves a separate uh, a conversation. But I think in comparison to uh, the Lithuanian question I was trying to address, um, what, uh, what really interests me in the question of Lukashka Square, it shows a very democratic process of trying to negotiate the uh, monument for a, for a nation in the 21st century. So the fact that it's still um, um, unresolved suggests that it's very hard to proclaim something uh, as final when it comes to embodying the nation. Whereas um, uh, when it comes to Minsk, uh, a lot of those um, uh, socialist realist spaces you're referring to obviously remained almost frozen in time and haven't really been challenged uh, due to the lack of opportunities for, um, for uh, you know, a broader public debate about the meaning of certain monuments and squares. As you know, all the street names remain the same, largely. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the historical uh, figures that were recovered later are only um, you know, um, given their names to smaller streets in micro uh, rayonas. Uh, so uh, it's certainly uh, a different uh, situation. I think what uh, also interests me as a researcher is the, the fate of Jewish memory in Belarus, which was once before the Second World War, one of the key uh, centers of uh, Ashkenazi Jewish culture, uh, where there's you know, certainly uh, no traces of that culture left, and how Lukashenko throughout his presidency was using uh, the partial recovery of Jewish memory to, uh, you know, to reach some negotiations and debates with the EU and the West. So, for instance, uh, there's a tragic uh, site just outside Minsk, uh, the Malutre Senyens, the former concentration camp, one of the biggest concentration camps, which for a long time was uh, ignored and avoided by the authorities, but then, uh, Quite recently, uh, Lukashenko, uh, before the uh, tragic war in Ukraine, Lukashenko invited uh, all the nations of Europe whose citizens perished there to erect their own monument there. So obviously that was a very bargaining uh, moment and opportunity uh, for him to invite uh, the Austrian um, uh, uh, you know, party, the German party, to engage with, um, with uh, I suppose, Belarus in, in, in that diplomatic, uh, diplomatic way. So memory of a culture that is no longer there became a, a bargaining chip, I suppose. Uh, with regards to larger Soviet squares, yes, I think uh, there are some informal practices which were sort of challenging the meaning of certain uh, monuments. So, for instance, all of those idols dotted around. There was one Belarusian artist whose name uh, escapes me at the moment, but he did an intervention whereby he was placing uh, different cubes on the square and arranging them in a rather phallic uh, manner next to statues. So kind of, uh, you know, questioning the importance of those power radiating vertical symbols. Um, he was imprisoned shortly after, or during his, uh, t temporarily, during his uh, uh, performative action. So obviously that kind of engagement with a uh, civic space in Belarus still remains um, outside of uh, possibility. 
Okay, thank you. Our time is going to the end. But I have a very short question to the Dr. Dmitry Andreevs. What is your favorite Soviet monument in Latvia? <laughs> <laughs> and why? <laughs> well, I, I you, would... You brought your PhD yeah, thesis. Uh, I mean, yeah, my, my PhD thesis was on the removal of Lannan monuments, so that's the one I know most about. Um, I don't really have a favorite one, but I think the point uh, that's potentially worth stressing on that is that, you know, um, the same, you know, has been, has been kind of, you know, suggested there are only so many ways we can deal with monuments and that, you know, not all monuments are for... You should mention only one. Only one, one yeah. I don't know. Uh, basically, I just wanted to, to make a point about, you know, that, you know, we still have, um, you know, modification of monuments, right, when we think about the Rifleman <laughs> Monument, 1905 <laughs> Monument, the Salisville's Memorial. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess I don't really have a favourite one that I can name. But yeah, I definitely, you know, um, the most familiar for me is the London Monument, just because I, I write my PhD on. <laughs> on. In Riga? In Riga, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that we had a very uh, wonderful uh, panel. Thank you for all three speech speakers. Uh, thank you very much. And we are finishing.